Hello everyone, welcome to Engineers Ireland and welcome to Applied Mathematics. Uh, if you have any sort of a liking for maths at all, this is definitely the coolest little subject that you have for the Leaving Cert. It's quite a short course um, and it's a one that you can master. It does a few other things. Because you're practicing a lot of maths in it, your mathematics goes up, so you should be able to get a better grade in um, your straightforward maths course. And there's also a crossover with physics, so if you're doing physics, you'll find that the mechanics side are covered quite early on in the applied maths. And you go so much further in applied maths that you look back at the mechanics and physics and you think, doddle, no problem. So there's a lot to be gained by doing this subject. It's basically set up um, as a series of set pieces. You know, if this was a war, it wouldn't be the long campaign you'd be looking at. You'd be looking at a few set battles in the war. These things relate to um, motion of, let's say, cars, which is the one we, type of thing we will start on today, linear motion. And it also deals with the par parabolic paths of things we'll say thrown or fired at an angle. Um, collisions of, let's say, for example, billiard balls. I learned a lot about billiards from studying applied mathematics. And there's a lot of good stuff on um, pendulums. Um, and you get good practice in calculus. There's a lot to play with in this little subject. To begin with, what I'd like to do is to just go back a little bit in time and to explain to you a few little things that will help, at least in this first class. Back in the 1200s, when scholarly activity really started to move forward again, when people came out of the Dark Ages, um, there were a group of people called the Scholastics. They were mainly centred in the UK in Oxford and in France, in Paris. Now, there were others, but they were the two main centres. The four leading lights of that included um, William of Ockham, and Ockham's razor is uh, what's attributed to him. And he basically says that if you have to develop a theory of something, and if you have two or three versions, the one with the least amount of variables is the one you should use because there's less things that can go wrong with it. Now, it's also called the principle of parsimony. It was an amazing thing for a guy to work out back at a time when mathematics was extremely poorly understood, when, like the old Greeks, they really only had two types of numbers, whole numbers and fractions. They certainly didn't believe in square roots, like root two, irrationals, things that go on for and ever and ever in decimal points. And the other very odd thing about that time, and for a thousand years before them, is algebra and geometry were two completely separate things. There was no sense of connection between them. Even these guys, the scholastics, didn't make that connection. Despite this poor mathematics, they managed, amongst other things, to come up with a rule that was referred to as the Merton Rule. Now, Merton is, I believe, one of the colleges in Oxford, and certainly it came from, uh, from the Oxford area. The Merton rule basically said that if something starts from rest and increases its velocity at a steady rate, so it has even acceleration, that after a certain length of time, when it has reached its maximum velocity for that length of time, that it will have gone exactly as far as something else that kept a steady velocity all the way through that time equal to half that maximum. Now normally the story, uh, or sorry, the Merton rule was explained through a story and it was a variation on the Greek uh, tortoise and the hare problem. You would have all learned that little story when you were um, much younger. Their version was as a tortoise passed a hair, the hair just begins to move. And when the tortoise's speed has gradually increased until it's exactly twice that of, or sorry, once the hair's speed has
has gradually increased until it's exactly twice that of the tortoise. Once that happens, it's caught up. Now, that was a phenomenal thing for these guys to deduce, given how poor their mathematics was, and there was really no understanding of things like rate of change and stuff like that. And don't forget, this was um, maybe about 1325, 1330s, that kind of time. The very first clock that was made was in the 1330s in Milan. It was, it was after the formulation of that rule. The first clock in Paris was in around 1370. So the scholastics who were mainly in Paris and in London, or sorry, in Oxford, really didn't even have a clock. If you even take it on a different level, they were still trying to use sun dials to divide a day into 12 parts. The odd thing was, in the height of summer, you'd have something like 85 of our present day minutes in an hour, and you might only have about 28 of them in the deepest part of winter in December. So even the concept of a twelfth division of daylight hours was a variable feast depending on what time of the year you were and especially the more northerly you moved into Europe. So even on a given day a twelfth division of the daylight hour or of, sorry of daylight varied in Europe depending on how far up you were up in the world. So what happened? These guys got this rule and they couldn't prove it. But very early on in 1300s, a guy, a French guy was born. Um, I think, you know, I'm poor on French by the way, in pronunciation, but Aleman is how I pronounce the name of the village and it's near Cannes. This guy was called Nicole and he's uh, normally referred to as Nicole Doresme and often is just simply referred to as Orism. He finished up uh, lecturing in the college in Paris. He proved the Merton rule. And more, he did many other things. He was an amazing character and almost nobody knows about him. 200 years before Galileo, he deduced relative motion. He even brought it to the point where he knew that there's no other forms of motion other than relative motion that even to talk about one thing moving, not even two, only makes sense from the viewpoint of another. That puts him in the same league as Einstein, because that's one of the concept, concepts in Einstein's relativity. A phenomenal character. How did he prove the Merton rule? Well, that's the guy who unified geometry and algebra. What he did was he developed the graph. Big letdown, I know. But it's just because you've been using it so long and you think so little of it that you don't realise how powerful it is. In an ordinary graph, whatever, it, whatever we're looking at, let's say for argument's sake, we've graphed a circle. The interesting thing, what a, what the Cartesian coordinate system allows us to is this circle, a geomet geometric shape, can now be interpreted in numbers, in so much x's and so many y's. This x value belongs to that y value. And we can define every single point all the way around this circle here in terms of x's and y's. So now if you're looking at geometry, you can interpret it into algebra. If you're looking at a function, you can convert it into a geometric shape. It's very powerful. So let's see what he did to solve their problem. We'll say this is velocity going in that direction. And this is time, increasing in that direction. So velocity increases up here. So the bigger velocity, it's like x and y. Basically it is. Only, as we've been talking and say, or saying in the maths courses, that one of the big tricks in mathematics is to name things. 
And you can give a name either to simplify or you can give a name to bring relevance to it. And in this case, we're bringing relevance to X and Y by calling it time and velocity. So, at the start of the story, the tortoise has just gotten to the location of the hare. So we'll call that time zero, and we know zero is where the x and y axis join. So we'll say this is his velocity, and as time continues, he goes on and on and on and on. That line, by the way, is supposed to be exactly parallel to the x-axis, okay? Don't think it's increasing. That's a nice flat line showing exactly the same velocity. At this time here, the velocity is the same as at this time, as this time, any other time, there's no change. We can call this, we'll just call it V, for want of a better name. Now, the hare starts to move. He starts from rest and linearly increases his velocity until he gets to twice the velocity of the tortoise, 2v. So there it is, 2v. And we're going to stop our story here. And the amount of time it took to do this, we'll just call t. Well, it's kind of obvious, first letter of time, we'll call it t. So, what have we got? We've got two shapes here. We've got a rectangle, and we've got a triangle. The rectangle is be between the two vertical lines, the y-axis, and at time equal to t, and the x-axis, and the v. So I'll just give you a rough outline of that. There's a rectangle, and we have a triangle. So, let's work out these areas. For the tortoise, we can say the area is equal to v by time. For the hair, the area is equal to half by 2v by time which is Vt. So, we can say, well, they're the same. Vt is Vt. The areas inside the rectangle and the triangle are exactly the same. So what does this mean then? This is where an amazing aspect comes out from uh, Nicole's concept of being able to graph things. Because oddly enough, these may be areas but they represent lengths. That must have been a phenomenal uh, leap of reasoning way back in 1350s. So, what do we have? We measure velocity in meters per second, for example. They're the standard SI units. So if I look at velocity by time, I'll say, ah, this is the velocity 1 meters per second, and I'm going to multiply it by time in seconds. So all we have, if we go over to the side here, that's a bit like saying um, x over y divided by, or sorry, multiplied by y. They'll cancel, and you're left with x. So what are we left with here? We're left with m, just meters. So velocity by time is distance. So the hair has just caught up with the tortoise. Now, it may sound like a silly problem, but believe it or not, you're already halfway through a chapter in applied mathematics. The accelerated linear motion, oh by the way, just before I start, there are two books on the course. The usual one that people use, and it's been around for a very long time, is this one by Murphy. The other one I can live. This is the one I normally use, and I will be mainly dipping into this one, only because of familiarity. Murphy's book wouldn't have been around as long as it's been around unless it was good. So, based on this particular one, we can look at accelerated linear motion.
And this is, it's chapter three in the book because there's obviously an introduction and then there's a bit of a yap about things such as forces, all of which we'll get to, but I think it's better to kind of dive into the deep end of the pool and have a good swim around the place in applied maths and get to the end of a chapter by the end of one quick talk. So, what we've learned here is we can actually graph time against velocity. Let's see what we know in relation to mathematics. Linear geometry. All about the line. X against Y. And don't forget our story about the tortoise and the hare. We're still an XY problem, it's just we gave them names, time and velocity. So, the equation I want you to keep in mind is this particular one for the line. Where M is the slope. That's the slope of the line. And this C value here is where it meets the axis, the Y axis. That's C. Okay? Let us bring that straight across time and velocity. And let us again pick an end time here. We're saying for this particular problem, at time zero, something is already going at a certain velocity. It's going at that velocity, which we can call u. Hmm, that didn't turn out too well. Give me a second. That turned out even worse. It isn't easy to use this thing, you know. U. It's the initial velocity of this particular thing that's moving in a straight line. It finishes up going at a different velocity, which we can call V. And it went, took t seconds to do that. What can we say? First off, this nice straight line I can get an equation for that. It's exactly the same as over here on the left hand side, or sorry, the right hand side. We'll get an equation like this. So we can say velocity at any given point in time, like this time t, velocity, v, it's going to be equal to the start off velocity, just like in this case, okay, the start off velocity, which is u plus the slope, okay, which we'll just call f for the moment, and I'll explain in a second, multiplied by t. It's a straight line equation. This thing here is just the slope of that line there. That's just where that line meets the velocity axis, the y-axis. So, slope. Let's find the slope of this line. If you know, again, from your geometry, slope m, if we had two points, x1, y1, x2, y2, it's y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. And we'll say, hmm, that is the difference in y between the two points divided by the difference in x between the two points. That now allows us to know what f is. It's a difference in velocity divided by a difference in time. Let's do our same little trick we did the last time and try and work out what f means. Look at the dimensions. And in applied maths, you learn just how important dimensions are. So when you're reading in your physics book that you have to always show dimensions, it's very important because dimensions tell you almost everything you need to know about things. Velocity, meters per second. And I'm going to divide that by time, which is seconds. So I have meters per second squared. 
and meters per second squared is acceleration. So what I can say now is that a velocity at any point in time is equal to the initial velocity plus acceleration by the multiplied by the amount of time it took. So our tortoise started off with an initial velocity of zero. Or sorry, our hair, initial velocity of zero. So what we had was V was equal to FT. You've already now got the first of the three rules that are employed in this chapter. And all it is is the equation of a straight line. You might be surprised to find that it's just as easy to get the second one. Come back to this line again on the left hand side. I can say to you, I've got a somewhat odd shape here. That has to be equal to a more regular shape. What if I just got the average of this end side here and this end side here? And I can form a square or a rectangle, apologies. I can form a rectangle. And we know that the area underneath a line when we are plotting time against velocity we know that that actually represents a distance okay so let's have a look at what it represents u plus v it's the initial velocity plus the final velocity divided by two it's the average of them which is equal to that blue line running across here and it's multiplied by time and we know that that is distance And that is normally referred to as an S. The same way as acceleration is generally referred to as F, unless it's acceleration due to gravity, and then that is, believe it or not, surprise, it's G. So, this thing here, once you rewrite it, is the second law. And all it comes from is getting the average of this drawing up here. In other words, finding a rectangle that has the same area as this other more complicated shape. We can express that slightly differently and say that S is equal to ut plus a half f t squared. And it just pops out from the last equation and this one. So you have two of them. The third one, which is nice and handy, <coughs> is you already have two equations now. Both of them, unfortunately, have a reference to time in them. Now, why that's unfortunate is because there are many problems you will get where you won't be told the time and you aren't even asked for the time. So why should you go and find out time? In your two equations, you will notice that this one here has a t squared in it. And the last one that we had, I'll rewrite it for you just in case you've forgotten it. That one just has time to the power of 1. In algebra, uh, where you cover simultaneous equations, you will have been taught from junior cert about linear simultaneous equations, and you could have three of them, and you would kind of drop out 
variables by adding or subtracting certain combinations of these lines. But for the leaving cert um, algebra, you're introduced to a situation where you have one linear equation and you'll have one quadratic equation, which is what we have here, power of 2. In these, what you're supposed to do is go to the linear equation and express time in terms of your other variables, and then you plug it in to this equation, both here and here. And you solve, and you get your third equation. Now, <clears throat> that's the third of them. The only things you've done to get these three equations is to use the most primitive geometry stuff that you learnt actually for your junior cert the only thing is you could possibly fool yourself into thinking this is complicated why? because it isn't in terms of x's and y's we're just talking about distances and times the interesting thing is when you were all the way for many years plotting on xy plots you thought it was 3 in the x direction and 5 in the y direction. X's and y's were themselves just names. You could have been plotting points on the track of a satellite for all you knew. But now what happens in applied mathematics is instead of a nice abstract x and y, all very important in pure maths, you're now giving a name to it and you're starting to find that not only the maths that you're doing for a leaving cert, but maths that you've known for years, easy maths, can actually start to produce for you really, really useful information in relation to everyday things. So then, <clears throat> by the way, one of the reasons, and, and this is me interrupting a little, one of the reasons I choose this book is um, he does things like this. He talks about, he'll give an example which is a full solution, and he goes all the way through on a full solution. Doing everything for you. He gives examples then which will help you. Having gotten an example, um, a full solution you can do these. He also produces something that he calls a guided solution where he will just give you the skeleton, the outline of it, and then he leaves you to do in between bits so that you get to make that step between seeing an example given in the book and having to launch into doing full exercises all on your own. That in-between step, I find, is very useful. So it would be certainly one of the points that has had me like this book for a long time. The nice thing about this book, from my perspective, is having talked about these three equations, well, there's nearly a page of exercises there, and there's another page of exercises. And now, whatever it is, seven, eight pages into the chapter, we start talking about time, velocity time graphs. And you guys have already done that. You did it when you followed the problem on the Merton rule, which is the tortoise and the hare problem. What are these things? Velocity time graphs. They can look like this. At this point in time, don't worry about the particular equations we talked about now. Let's just see if you can tr if you can interpret the graph, okay? They look like this. Time. Velocity we're not even going to put dimensions on this graph because I just want you to talk um, and uh, reason your way through this. At time zero, something is starting with a zero velocity. The velocity increases linearly. That just means straight line in geometry terms. up to a certain given velocity. Linearly, it has increased. 
it's a straight line. The area underneath this, once you work it out, tells you the distance that this object has moved the slope of that line is the acceleration easy what happens after that well most likely because if it was a car it has reached either the appropriate limit for the piece of road or the driver has decided that even though I haven't reached the limit I'm going to drive at this speed because I feel that I can respond um, in adequately to whatever happens. So anyway this guy decides no more acceleration I'm going to hold a constant velocity. So this is my interpretation of a straight line a flat straight line still holding to the same velocity and that's kept up to here in time. So he started going with a constant velocity from here across to this one. What do we know? The area inside this rectangle is the distance travelled in that piece of time. The slope. The slope of a flat line is zero. Mm. Slope is equal to zero. No acceleration. Exactly like geometry of the line. What happens then? Well, something must have shocked this guy because he decelerates and he does so very quickly. Because by the time, by this extra little bit of time, this driver has stopped. This slope here it's a negative because it's a negative it means velocity is going down pretty obvious watch you go across here you get a higher velocity than if you go across here than if you go across here velocities are getting smaller so a retarding um, acceleration a deceleration is a negative slope exactly the same as in the line what you will notice too is this line here falls much much faster than the original red line actually rose at. So our deceleration is much faster than the acceleration. And you'd say, how long did it take this guy to break? Well, the area in this side, inside this triangle will give you that distance. The same way as the slope here will tell you how fast the car decelerated. Easy stuff. Slight variations to this problem could have you looking at something like that. Whereas after a given amount of time, you haven't finished up at zero because we're just looking at a particular window of time. It might be saying after a certain length of time he has got to a particular velocity and that he had started at a given velocity. Now you think about it. Look at this first area here. That first area is exactly the same as this rectangular area. And that rectangle, what you can see is this little bit up here, that little triangle, you know, I can move it down here and say, yes, excellent. That's that little red one up here. Can come all the way down here. So. I know that this blue line has all of what was inside the red um, shape. So that rectangle tells me, and that rectangle tells me how far they've gone. So the exact same reasoning will work with everything else along here. We will get a rectangle to represent this. If you don't feel like using that rectangle, well, given that this original shape looks like this, there's nothing stopping you working out that area and then working out that area. So long as you make up the shape, I don't care. And one of the nice things about applied maths is 
the only thing you have to do is solve the problem. You can solve it any way you like. Obviously, in an exam, if it says use, we'll say, a relative motion to solve, you wouldn't be going along and using a different method than the one they've asked you to use. And secondly, often when they say to you, use relative motion, it's because if you didn't use it, it would be really hard and they're really giving you a hint. Okay? All of these problems we've looked at so far, they've had whatever it was, a vehicle moving or a person walking or it could have been a projectile, uh, whatever it is, they've all been going in the same direction. If you change direction, in other words, if something this is just looking at the ground now rather than a velocity time diagram, if you're going in that direction and then you change direction. What do you do about that? It's impossible. Like Nicole Deresme informed us, it's impossible to talk about velocities or movements without a frame of reference. Now, our frame of reference we set up over here. This is going to be my zero location. Okay, whether it's velocity up here or whether it's distance up here or whether it's acceleration, it makes no difference. What it's saying is, okay, if it's time along here, who cares? It could be distance along here. All it mean uh, the important thing is that I've set up a location from which I discuss everything. Now, in your geometry, you know, to move to the right is a plus move to the left is a minus. To move, if you're to go down in this direction, it's a minus. And if you're to go up in that direction, it's a plus. All you've done is you've set up a frame of reference. For example, we say going up when we refer to moving north in the hemisphere. Uh, sorry, in, in, the, in the world, any part in the world. And we talk about going uh, down if we're going further south. The only reason we do that is that's convention. It could have been, if history played out differently, that we'd be saying going up to the south and down to the north. But we have a convention and we stick to it because we don't want to confuse each other. Applied maths does the same thing. It starts you with a convention and you move using that and then you can actually say things such as going in that direction we'll call positive in that direction we'll call negative so you can move 50 meters and then go back 30 meters so it'll be 50 minus 30 meters all we're doing is we're stepping back into good old geometry when we're dealing with stuff like this The little graphs that we were looking at, the ones that had a acceleration up for a certain distance, they could be slightly more complicated. For example, Here's an interesting thing. What we're doing is we're picking successive points in time. Obviously, zero to begin with. Then this point in time, we'll just say the first point in time. Over here, a second point in time, a third one, a fourth one, and a fifth one. Inside each one of those, when I'm looking at this first one here, I don't have to concern myself at all with anything over here. I'm looking at this little window of time related to whatever item that is moving. And obviously when I am looking at this one, I don't care about the red one at this one and I don't care about the ones after it, I'm looking at that little one. Now, it may, and they do call it a uh, motion of a body taken in successive stages and you'd go, oh my goodness, that is definitely getting complicated. 
it isn't. Because what I would like you to notice is we can look at that graph. Let's look at the shape of it. Following it again. Well, you've been doing things like that certainly since second year or third year. You were using um, the Simpson rule and or L'Hopital's rule, for example, where you were given a certain distances and certain heights, and you were asked to work out areas. Well, that's all you're at again. Nothing more than that. The interesting thing is, if we now look at the points that we have here, that one, that one, that one, that one, that one, and that one. In reality, and by the way, this isn't on the chapter, it would be be, uh, would be beyond the scope of the chapter, but you'll see how easy this is. The reality of it is, those points could belong to a curving relationship, a one that looks like this, shown in blue. And that curving relationship has been split into small parts, and the only rule that matters is that between any, between inside and the split, that it's merely a straight line. And now you're back using, as we were saying, L'Hopital's rule, Simpson's rule, or whatever else it is, or these nice little equations that we have now in applied mathematics to solve a problem, which, believe it or not, is a very complicated, curvy one in reality. So long as the approximation is accurate enough to give us meaningful results, then we're happy. Applied mathematics loves to find the simple way of solving problems, even to, well, especially to complicated uh, methodologies. There are two last little pieces in the section here. One of them has to do with using calculus in this stuff. We don't have to cover them now at the moment because I would like us to get through calculus in the mathematics to be certain that uh, the basic rules that I want to bring into applied maths will be covered in the mathematics. But all I would say to you is, it gets no harder. You'd be surprised at the type of linear problems that you can solve by these three basic little equations that we've just touched on and that you are expected to learn off well. They're in the logbooks, but it would be a shame to be wasting your time flicking through the logbook when you're in an exam, when time is in such short supply. In relation to all of these problems that we've looked at, they have one thing in common. They're a constant acceleration problem. The acceleration is zero, or it'll linearly increase or linearly decrease. We only can use these three equations for constant acceleration problems. If acceleration is not constant, the best we could possibly do is approximate the curving relationship of velocity against time with a piecewise continuous. I've always liked that term and I'm only saying that to impress you right now, okay? And you won't hear it for another perhaps two years when you're in second year in college. But all you're doing here, but they don't tell you, is replacing a complex fun function with a piecewise continuous set of linear functions. Press of that. And that works great in parties. And you actually can solve a lot of problems, but unless the approximation is good enough. It means that the acceleration is not capable of being expressed even in small steps in a linear fashion. If that's the case, you can only solve these problems using calculus. So um, that's why I'm leaving the last little bit. And it does state on the book that when you've gone far enough in your maths and in your applied maths, let's look at this little bit, it gets no harder. You just need to know calculus. You've actually got to the end of the first question in applied mathematics. The second one, which we will cover the next time, has to do with firing projectiles. So all of you guys who would like to know how far a bullet will go if you fire from a particular gun. Now, unfortunately, and I have to tell you in advance, this is in a vacuum. So we look at it in a vacuum next week. <laughs>